Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for coming to the channel. And we have a very special guest on today's show. We have Mr. Scott Thomas. Scott is a husband and a father. He's been in the wealth services financial uh, industry for over 35 years, and he's very adept in the wealth transfer. And we thought today it'd be good to have an expert such as him kind of lean his musings as to why he feels we're coming up on the wealth transfer sooner than later and steps that we can prepare in stewardship. Before we get started, if you like the show, please do like, subscribe, and share the program. It does help our channel grow and let other followers like you become abreast of the information. Scott, welcome, and thank you so much for coming on our podcast. Thank you, John. Appreciate your time. So our viewers always like what we do because it's succinct, so I'm going to keep in that same uh, line of uh, discussion. Um, Scott, in, in your estimation, can you kind of talk to the viewers about what is the difference between a Christian that's a financial advisor versus a kingdom advisor? Yeah, super question. So I meet people all the time and they say, oh yeah, I've got a guy from my church and he's my financial advisor. And quickly I ask a few questions about the types of questions they ask. Mm -hmm. And what happens is we all want somebody competent, whether you're a Christian or not, uh, you want a competent person that understands the markets that's acting in your best interest. That's that's a given. But what happens in the kingdom advisor, highly trained Christian biblical principles is that uh, for 15 years, I've been involved with a group called Kingdom Advisors. It's global. It's training. Um, there's study groups, monthly study groups. I host one here in my office. And so I have other advisors. We sometimes have attorneys or CPAs or mortgage people or others come and see what it's about and pastors. Uh, I've invited a bunch of pastors to it. They've come to it and said, I had no idea there was this kind of training and this kind of discussion around important topics about money and the biblical principles, principles that surround that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, if you have training that is now with a biblical worldview versus a secular worldview, then you're going to ask questions into eternity. You're going to ask questions. And if you're not getting those questions right, your, your advice is going to be wrong. So if you're a believer and you have an eternal perspective, you want somebody asking and guiding you, almost discipling. Not that I'm telling people this is what you ought to do but I'm asking them and praying for them and leaning into that so that uh, they have an opportunity to hear God's voice for themselves. That's really important. Yeah, no, absolutely. Discernment, as we always discuss on our shows, is, is paramount. Um, let's back up a second, Scott, just so the viewers have sort of a cursory overview. We, we always like our guests to kind of speak for themselves, obviously, and hear from the horse's mouth rather than us just reciting a resume. So just talk to our viewers a little bit about some of your background, how you started in the financial industry, some of your accomplishments and pedigrees, and you know, kind of what you're working on now from a nonprofit perspective. Yeah. So I uh, actually started in 1986. Uh, there were, had some friends from church that said, hey, come check out this organization. I know you're doing um, accounting for a, a big trucking company and you're finishing school at night. I had a few classes to finish up. And so um, I went and checked it out and I got super excited. It was a fee-based financial planning, which there weren't any national articles back in the 80s even talking about this until like 1991. So it was a family office type setting. We had some very wealthy people that we were working with. Uh, we also had a big Fortune 100 corporation, had some executives that needed financial planning, got to work with some of those people. It was exciting. Um, did that for a couple of years. I found that um, it was really hard to go out and sell that as a young guy and people didn't know what it was. And so I had to kind of drop back into a commission mode. So here I am selling mutual funds. I'm doing insurance products. And so I'm doing the commission thing, trying to make a living. And so I did that for a few years, but the calling was back to the planning, the core of the planning that I started with. And I wanted to get back to that space. And so I was working 
almost like uh, salmon going to the spawning ground. Got to get back to that space of of real planning where you're talking about governmental benefits. You're talking about how tax is affected, the estate plan, the how it fits together, the values that that flow into that. And so I really wanted to get back to that. And and really, I did in 2011. Um, I was able to make the jump and create my own RIA, uh, Registered Investment Advisor. I'm a chartered um, uh, chartered advisor in philanthropy. That's something else that I got back in 2010. I got the Chartered Financial Consultant, which was basically the CFP plus four more courses. Um, and it was taken as 10 courses. I did that over a period of about five years. I'm also a retirement income certified professional, which is very narrow focus on retirement income. And then I'm also the, a certified kingdom advisor, which was uh, 20 courses in biblical studies and then this ongoing um, continuing education and the monthly involvement that I have there. I'm very engaged with that. So those are a few things about what I do. I am a fee advisor, so I do some assets under management. Mm -hmm. I do um, a fee financial plan. Uh, I had a lot of people come to me back in 2012, 13, 14, 15, doing a lot of social security planning before anybody else was really doing that. I find that I tend to go a little early into things. I'm like an early adopter. And so, um, you know, that's led me to something that I'm doing right now. One of the things that I'm doing right now is in an early adoption mode is a lot of people, they'll say, I hate annuities or I love annuities and or I don't understand them. There's actually a lot of the top insurance companies in the world have an RIA fiduciary fee annuity products. Yeah. And a lot of people are surprised because 99% of the insurance agents or advisors out there don't know that there are platforms that are now transforming, looking at all annuities to evaluate cost, uh, fees, uh, you know, do the comparison. There's third party groups like uh, Morningstar that provide some of that, but there are actually platforms and um, professionals that do this full time. That's my back office that I can tap into this. So what happens is um, people have the freedom and the flexibility. There's no surrender charge. You go into the annuity and you want to get out six months later, no cost, no fees. You're not handcuffed. Very unusual. Or if somebody is handcuffed in their current annuity, we can also evaluate ways to improve the company that they have. And we have people in the back office that are licensed that actually work with those companies and can usually rescue that and then look for the moment when that could be changed into a, an annuity that might cost 2% less per year. More money in your pocket, better stewardship, um, and more flexibility. So that's one of the things that I'm doing right now. On the estate planning side, something else that I'm super excited about is um, on my website, on the homepage, it has an estate settlement tool. And the estate settlement tool is beautiful because um, my father passed away earlier this year. My mom passed away just a few months ago. Um, there's always a lot of complications. So over the last nine years, my family, the five of us, have gotten together regularly on the phone. We've had Zoom calls. We've been planning stuff, working through VA benefits and Social Security and all the different things preparing. Well, you can spend an awful lot of time. And if there are assets, you can spend uh, on average, you're going to spend over 100 hours trying to settle out an estate. And so this tool is actually um, gives you a template. There's a free version of it. But if you want all the tools that bring all of your assets, all of your insurance, investment, banking, everything into one portal, you pay a one-time fee, it's less than 150 bucks. Mm -hmm. And it is an amazing tool. Even if you have an attorney, even if you, you want to communicate with your family, it will actually put everybody into communication. So um, one of my friends, Ron Blue, says, 
his view of a successful estate plan is that one year after mom and dad die, everybody's still friends. The family are still friends. That's his view of an, a successful estate plan. Because mm -hmm. I see so many people that fight. They argue. They got this. Uh, somebody was supposed to do this. I know people who haven't talked to their siblings in 20 years because of some squabble or somebody didn't communicate properly. This is one of those mechanisms before your parents die. It is fabulous to build into that, preparing for that moment. So uh, that's something I would love to have a, maybe in a whole additional conversation uh, in regards to the estate settlement tool. Absolutely. Well, thanks for your detail and your candor. And again, I'm sorry for the loss of your parents. So Thank you. I knew you had told me about that earlier this year. Um, actually, that kind of brings a good segue, Scott, to another question I had is, so I understand, and you've kind of touched on it, that you work with a broad range of age groups and demographics mm -hmm. and so forth uh, in, in terms of greater transparency to the fiduciary side. Um, could you share maybe some uh, newer books and things that have helped you serve you in this capacity? Yeah. Um, so um, I read the De the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, you know, the Robert Kiyosaki, right. and that has been fabulous for especially for a lot of my younger people that I meet with, college kids, my own children, to talk about the relationship between. Uh, a balance sheet and an income statement and do it in a practical manner. Uh, in fact, uh, my wife and I just had our middle child come into the office um, just about two months ago. And mm -hmm. we had this conversation. We put everything on the board and he was able to grasp it all. And now he is making planning decisions and we're having conversations that are meaningful. I did this with my oldest son and, and it was very helpful um, my daughter, we've had the conversation, but she's not quite ready to dig into it. She's in college still. So, mm -hmm. uh, but that's one conversation. There are lots of tools that as somebody's at maybe a place, uh, juncture in their life, then I can bring, um, books or materials to kingdom advisors, typically in about three or four of the, um, the programs each year will have a tool or a template or some kind of an assessment to help people where they are, whether they're young and, and trying to make life decisions or they're older and they're transitioning out of a business or trying to figure out things as far as giving plans or um, uh, how they're going to handle, handle their estate and that communication. Mm. Lots of different tools, mm. lots of different methods for that. Great. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate that. I um, just want to pivot a little bit because people kind of know us for a number of things, but primarily and um, um, half the reason you're here, obviously, the kingdom side and the financial side. So balancing the conversation a little bit, you sort of where you're sort of in an interesting um, situation, we'll call it for lack of a better term, in that, you know, you have been in the traditional Fed system, mm -hmm. you know, with your training and your background, your acumen, and now you're now aware of the wealth transfer as it relates to the currencies and the bonds and metals and all that. Um, as you look back at where you were and what you know now uh, from the wealth transfer standpoint, how has that affected uh, your purview of things and how you uh, give guidance to your clients? Yeah. Um, <laughs> as soon as you were saying that, I was thinking about a conversation back in January um, and it was out of town and there were a bunch of people down from New York and they were all quoting Janet Yellen. Oh, it's uh, inflation is transitory. <laughs> and I raised my hand and I have to be the bad guy out of a hundred people. And I go, yeah, you believe this, you believe transitory. And, you know, if people were shaming me at the break, you're sure. questioning these guys, these guys are brilliant. And I don't buy it. I don't yeah. buy a lot of the things that I'm hearing from the government. I have seen way too much. And usually the way this shows up in a client conversation, and I had one this week, guy calls me up. He says, I'm not believing anything I'm seeing. Something doesn't seem right. Something in my gut says something is wrong here. And so then we start to have a conversation. And... Um, 
sometimes the, the question will be around um, national debt, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's a big one. And it's one that's not being debated out there. And it's one that I think we need to talk about it right here, especially here we are in November of 2023. And if we were to look back and say two years ago, what did it cost to service the national debt? It was $378 billion, okay? Mm -hmm. Now we're here. And think about this. In the next 12 months, $8.2 trillion in the next 12 months is going to mature. That means low-cost debt might be 2%, 2.5% you know, interest rate. And now we're going to be refinancing at five, six, seven percent. Right. We're, we're, we're talking about what the estimates are on this is that in 2024, the debt load carry is going to be over two trillion dollars. Now, let me put that in perspective. You take all of the personal income tax collected in a year. It's two point four trillion. We're approaching all of the income taxes just to cover the national debt in 2024. Now, if interest rates bump a little bit higher, we're upside down on that by 2025. What happens? What, what does that say about national debt? What does that say about how we can thrive? So we're already in a deficit. We're running what, what one point seven trillion dollar deficits, you know, over the last year, and and that's expected to be over the next few years. Mm -hmm. So that's a bad place. It's a bad place in terms of like people will say, well, you know, there was debt when when Reagan was in office. I was, I heard a, a guy on an old Zoom meeting. He's like, oh yeah, there was debt when Reagan was office. It's not that big of a deal. I'm going. You know, there was 970 million when he took office, less than 1 trillion. Wow. Okay, yeah, the interest rate was high. It was high, higher than it is today, but it was less than 1 trillion. Now you're 32, 33 times that? Yeah. It's a big deal. So, um yes it is. National debt transitory, inflation being transitory, um, raising interest rates. Um, another big deal is the BRICS. And you guys talk about it. I've heard you talk about it in other yep. things. Uh, you know, the BRICS, with people that don't know it, is Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and other countries that are now trading not in the US dollar, the petrodollar, and, right. and Saudi Arabia and others, now doing transactions that were um negotiated in 1973 by henry kissinger people that don't know this we came off the gold standard in 71 73 kissinger did this i remember those long lines for gas lines in 73 74 73 was a rough year yeah. one of the worst years in the stock market um uh, terrible time so we are moving towards um more catastrophic tr catastrophic events However, it we can do some things to prepare for that. There are things we can do that can be preparing for that. And so as I have conversations around debt and conversations around the devaluation of the dollar and what's going on with Wall Street, um, we, we look back a, a hundred years and we typically got half of our return from dividends and half of our return came from growth. And that was about nine and a half percent overall. Hmm. Um, and we're not seeing the economy growing the way the government is reporting. Right. Um, there are things that have happened just and, and I have to blame the media for part of this because they're not properly reporting things. And every time a labor report comes out, it gets revised and it's on page 37 of a financial publication as opposed to being let's put it right back out there and tell you what does this mean that's not happening today well you look at example yeah exactly scott you look at example uh, just one of many corporations like we were talking about on our earlier show this week about uh, the updates yellow trucking company this summer laid off thirty thousand mm -hmm. truckers 
they give in a severance package, could be two to four or five months, whatever their terms of agreement are. So the company is reporting them on the books as employee, but they're not. So it looks like they're there. But when that 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 severance period ends in the next cycle, it's not properly reflecting the rate of employment. So like you said, the media and the financial industries are, are kind of cooking the books with the numbers of employers and giving the public a misleading perception of how well the economy is growing versus what's actually happening, to your point. Yeah. I'll give you another example. Um, so back in February, I was at a big conference and there was a panel up and they were talking about things in the economy and growth and so forth and and job front, job was coming up and there was an economist up there. And and so they, they asked a question. They said, so uh, what do you think about how things are going in the economy? He says, well, I think things are going to go pretty well. And uh, the moderator <laughs> caught him off guard and said, well, um, are you guys hiring? <laughs> he goes, no, we're in a hiring freeze. He said, when was the last time you had a hiring freeze? He said, 2009. <laughs> Here we go again. So what does that say? And then another person said, could I see a show of hands of who else in this room has in financial services? These are all financial services. Who else in this room has a hiring freeze? And most of the hands went up. Wow. The majority of the hands. And so whether you were just an advisor or a uh, vendor firm, there was an overwhelming hiring freeze. What does the financial services know? They know a lot about this. They know a lot about what's going on with the economy. So that was a big red flag for me to come away from that and say, okay, well, I need to start talking to my clients about you know, gold and silver and seeds and food and um, preparation and you know, um, water supply. We've seen so much happen with COVID that I've encouraged people to think about, you know, your air and your water. Yep. I'm really glad you talked about the, the heirloom seeds and the metals component. We're going to touch on that in a second. But just to kind of sop up some of the uh, residual discussion we were having a minute ago, you touched on the, the Fed and the national debt. And uh, there's, there's sort of talks quietly about Powell raising the interest rates as a surprise in December, mm -hmm. which is going to take the market kitty corner off. Um, touch on that, if you would. And can you talk a little bit about the M2 money supply and what that means for the everyday person, please? Yeah. So um, if you just think logically, if there is, in fact, less demand for our dollars, and now people are trading outside of the dollar system, the, the U.S. petrodollar, and things are occurring outside of that. And there's less demand for people to buy our treasury, to buy our dollars, to hold our dollars and do business around the world. Mm -hmm. Then what's going to happen is they're going to be dumping those. And the Fed is probably going to have to raise rates a little bit more. OK, they're not they're saying, oh, we're on a pause right now. Um, but it's likely we may see this go up a little bit more because in order to get the demands for being able to refinance this $8.2 trillion over the next month, uh, year, 12 months, it's going to require that they pay a little bit more. Well, guess what? That ups our national debt more. It, um, you know, it, it creates more issues. And if less people are holding or we're having economic issues and as it moves our debt up, it's likely to reduce our credit rating again, possibly. There's talks about our credit rating dropping again, should the interest rate go up. And now when you look at coverage ratios and the things that they look at for the ratings, it's probably going to be a downgrade again. And that makes everything more expensive because now you have to move the rate up. You're fighting with this. The Fed can't win in this battle. Right. They're not, they're not going to be able to win this battle. It's going to end painfully one way or another. So let's talk about M2. M2 is the measure of the money supply. And we're talking about um, cash, checking, um, other types of deposits like CDs that can readily be available. Interesting enough, we look at the, the money supply and it's kind of going up a little bit and then COVID hits and it goes up dramatically because they're just dumping money into the money supply, paying people and, you know, uh, all, all the different incentives, governmental programs, paying people. And there was a lot of flush cash. So what did people do with the cash? 
Well, they went out and bought uh, exercise equipment because they're at home. They're um, now doing home improvements because they're at home a lot more, putting in a swimming pool, doing things. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. um, we've now come out where people are coming back to work and things are happening, but they've spent a lot of that. They also wanted to go on vacation. So vacations have been driven up a lot because people weren't on vacation. Um, you know, I had a client who was going to go on five cruises and those all got put on hold and they were doing five cruises and then three cruises. They were going to do eight cruises and they didn't get to go on all those. Now they're making up for it right now. Hmm. They're doing cruises like every other month right now to make up for it. Because they're like, I don't know when it'll shut down again. That's their view. <laughs> um, so with the M2 money supply, so there's only been a couple of tiny little wrinkles. If you were to go back, this is from the St. Louis Federal Reserve. And you can go to M2 and the St. Louis Federal Reserve. Go look this stuff up. Don't trust me. Go look at their charts. Look at the numbers. See where things are. So the money supply, we're talking uh, March of 22. It was kind of tapping out at the top end. $21.7 trillion March of 2022. Today, it's at 20.7 or 20.6, somewhere in there. So about 18 months later, we're down a trillion dollars. Money supply is down. Well, it doesn't shrink by that much. That's highly unusual. Mm -hmm. And in fact, there's a lot of people that you go to the bank and you say, okay, I'd like to cash this check for $10,000. You go try to do that at the bank today. They'll say, well, you have to make an appointment and come back on Tuesday and you're going to meet with our vice president or whatever. And they make it into an ordeal oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So being able to access cash is more difficult. So the government loves it when they can see our credit cards, they can see our spending, they can see um, where things are. They like all this electronic. The central bank digital currency is all about the lack of freedom, taking away your freedoms, taking away your, your choices. It's basically a, uh, a social credit score, Chinese social credit, mm -hmm. and you will have no freedom. I tell my, I tell all my friends, you will have no freedom under this. And it scares me. Do not elect this. They'll probably offer you some kind of incentive. We'll give you $2,000 a month. They'll, they'll offer something and I think that's what the ploy is. They're doing that in one of the European countries. They're testing it. And so they're offering people a monthly stipend to be on this system. Mm -hmm. Talk about don't UBI? Talk about UBI? Yeah, don't do it. Yeah. yeah. It, so it's, it's, it's slavery. Uh, it truly is slavery, and I would not go there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you, Scott, uh, for the, the articulation of detail. Do you want to learn something interesting about people? If you work for someone else and someone tells you to be somewhere at 9 o'clock in the morning, you will be there at 9 o'clock. When they tell you what to do, you do it. But when you tell yourself, I'm going to start my business next week, you don't do it. Why do you listen to someone else but not yourself? Why do you fulfill someone else's dream but not your own? When will you wake up and start living your own life instead of living for someone else? Join us to improve yourself every day. So, again, going back to a couple steps back to our, our conversation uh, minutes ago. Uh, so given that you're, like I said, now that you're on the other side of this, you're still a financial advisor, but you're, it's one of the reasons I wanted you to have on the show getting to know you is because you're one of the few financial advisors who understands the wealth transfer. Most of the financial advisors I've talked to are, uh, you know, wealth managers at the banks, private bankers have, they're completely asleep about this. They have no idea about the wealth transfer. They don't know about the currencies or the bonds or the, you know, of course they tell you, the major banks tell you not to buy gold and silver, but you, silver, but you look at their balance sheets and it's replete with it in the central bank over and over and over. So, oh, yeah. so when you talk to your, or let me, let me put it another way. Those who are watching the program today, and they're sort of on the fence. They know about the wealth transfer. They've heard about it. They haven't taken any action. And you've been talking, I, I'm hearing you saying talk about taking decisive action, being proactive, right? What would you say to them um, to recommend them without 
you know, push anything just from your heart in terms of conviction, what would you say to them in terms of being part of the wealth transfer and taking action in the areas of foreign currencies, metals, bonds, things of that nature? Yeah, so I think I need to back up just a tiny bit more. Sure. So Please. Um, I tell people to pray about everything. Yeah. My mom was all about prayer. And so, uh, in fact, I hired a couple of chaplains over two years ago. And um, one of them is very active. I pay her every week. Um, she is actively there as a chaplain, also as a life transition coach. And I recommend her to my clients, to their families to say, hey, your son's graduating from college. If he'd like to reach out to Christine, I would love for him to have a conversation with her. She's an expert at, at being able to help people sort out stuff like this. Or somebody calls me and says, you know, I just found out my wife has cancer. Mm. And I say, I'm so sorry. Um, you know something? If your wife would like to call and have Christine pray with her, I would love for her to do that. Or, you know, and, and so I've had lots and lots, dozens and dozens of opportunities over the last couple of years. In fact, my wife will have friends that, that come up to her and they'll say, hey, does your husband still have those uh, chaplain people? Because I want them to pray for my cousin or something. And mm -hmm. so can I get on the prayer, the prayer list? And so that's really important. Another thing I tell people is you've got to get to a place where you can hear your creator. Okay. So for me, I can be gardening. I can be uh, hiking on a trail in North Carolina, uh, you know, with the mountain trees and smelling the, the air and God speaks to me in a powerful way. I feel I feel his presence there. I also feel his presence when I'm out on the water. I row a boat. I'm out in nature. And mm. I feel God's presence and I can hear nudging and urging and I think better. And mm. so here's what I would tell you, John, and I tell everyone, you need to find that beautiful spot. I had a lady I was talking to yesterday. She says, Be the beach is my spot where I hear God. Well, it doesn't do that for me, but it does it for her. Guess what? We're all unique. We're all different. So yeah. it's not like there's one single answer for people. So you've got to start with prayer and listening to God and being in a space. But then, um, so in God's timeless truths, um, you know, God owns, all, God owns everything. You know, it's all his. And so God owns everything. We should, another truth is we should spend less than we earn. That's a biblical timeless truth. Um, we should manage debt or avoid debt because if you become too much, then you become the, the slave. Okay. Yeah. We should manage risk and think about risk. And that's kind of what you're talking about here. We're talking about some risk management issues. We should set some long-term plans. Have a plan in place and get counsel, seek counsel. Um, there's 271 specific verses that talk about warnings, specific warnings, and seeking counsel. Now, there's about 2,300 verses in the Bible that are about wealth, possessions, and eternity as it relates to that. Um, but we also need to be generous. And so that's another aspect of God's biblical truths is that when we're generous to the one who waters, he will himself be watered. And so if we back up on thinking about uh, currencies, thinking about different assets, um, I asked the question and I had some friends that were doing, um, they were down in Venezuela and Venezuela started crashing and Venezuela was the, one of the 10 wealthiest countries in the world. And when it started crashing, I said, what happened? How did, how did the people who were successful deal with that? And what he told me opened my eyes. And I think it's applicable right here. As he says, um, there were a bunch of people who moved out of the currency and got Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrencies, um, Ripple and XRP and, and those types of things. Mm -hmm. They also bought gold and silver in different forms and fashions, especially if you could have small uh, coins that were silver, you can trade in that so easily. They all, the successful ones all got into bartering. You've heard this before. Yeah. Um, so in the bartering thing, um, 
you have a service or you have a skill you want to get with other people and you're bartering and that's still a real important part of the economy down in brazil in fact their gdp growth is almost zero and almost nobody's doing their money through the banks they're not trusting it anymore and that could occur it's happened in zimbabwe it's happened in venezuela it's happened to other places where things have crashed and burned there was too much printing of money craziness by the politicians things that went on um they th thought that they can run on this debt scheme forever but it doesn't work that way it eventually gets gets found out and so by doing god's timeless principles you'll what you'll find is faith replaces fear contentment replaces greed okay Mm -hmm. um unity repl replaces conflict we want a lot more of that don't we mm -hmm. isn't that something valuable today i mean if we can have more peace and unity wow yeah i mean you can't you can't buy that you know you just sure. and, and and your health take care of your health people i mean i was telling my sons this the other day we were out to dinner and I was talking to him and they said, dad, what's, what's something that was really insightful that happened with a client. And I said, you know, I had this client that, that, uh, said, Scott, I just don't have time. I said, why don't you have time to come see me? You're retired. And he goes, I gotta go to the doctors. Well, tell me about that. And it was all week. We got a doctor's appointment for my wife and then the afternoon and it's three hours here and four hours here and I'm too tired. And, and, and it was literally the whole week. I mean, their life is like in doctor's offices. And I said, how did, how did this happen? He says, you wait till you get to my age. <laughs> well, he's not a lot older than me right now. This was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and like, he's sick all the time. I say, so what did you do while you were working so hard? And he says, I never took care of my health. Well, now he's paying for it. He didn't eat right. He didn't sleep. He was like, I, I can work. You know, I don't need to sleep. And so I told my boys, I am very hyper-focused on this. And they see it. They watch me being hyper-focused on good health and eating and nutrition and, and being careful about what you put in your body and how you do things. Because we got to be careful about this because this, this body, as it deteriorates, we're responsible for being good stewards of it. So back to gold and silver. Um, Venezuela, these people are thriving when they're bartering, when they're using alternative systems. So I encourage people to lean into gold and silver, especially if you're like really weary of the markets and you go i don't trust the stock market i don't trust the government i don't trust the government bonds you can trust gold and silver you can go there now one one negative about gold and silver is that it doesn't really pay you a dividend you know like a rent check from real estate it doesn't have an interest rate I mean, there's things you can do to get that working and trading. I mean, there's ways to make it work, um, but it's not a set it and forget about it like an annuity or, a, you know, a bond or something else where you don't have to think about it. But it's an important part of an insurance policy for peace of mind. It's important for trading, especially small incremental trades. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the silver market over the next few years, I believe it's going to blow up in a mighty way, like more so than, than other metals. Yeah. I think the demands for technology, the, the amount that's being mined, all the numbers that I've seen, all the technical stuff I've seen, I believe in it. I own silver as a disclosure. I own silver. I'm not planning on selling it. I bought some on a dip just um, a month ago. And so uh, it dips again. I'm going to buy some more. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Um, great, great information. And I agree with you so much. It's funny because you're talking about finding your your peaceful place. And for me, that's a, a, a field down the road from my house that's got a, a nature path and a baseball field and nice. throughout these neighborhoods that helps you stop, kind of stop and smell the roses, so to speak. 
Um, yep. So just touching up on that last point you were talking about, if someone were, because I, I usually get at least two or three calls or emails a week, you know, John, I got this 401k, it's not doing anything for me, and I'm trying to get it out, the company's fighting me on it, charging me ridiculous, you know, usury taxes and whatnot to try to de-incentivize me from taking it out and, and cashing it out. Um, obviously, it's different for each client, I understand, but given what you just said about gold and silver and other metals, if someone's on the fence about uh, cashing out their 401k or wants to take uh, get out their 401k and get physical metals with it, what do you typically say to them about that? Well, I'll tell you what the industry says. <laughs> the, the, the Wall Street industry and planning industry is they'll say, you know, five to 10% of your assets would be prudent to be in metals. That's just industry stuff. But, you know, everybody's uniquely different. Right. I have people who don't trust the, the stock market at all. And they're like, Scott, I'm completely in gold and silver and platinum. Right. Platinum is another excellent metal. Copper um, too. If I could buy copper at the right way, mm -hmm. I can't find a way to buy copper. I'd have to be like a scrap yard. But I looked at the margins and I looked at some stuff with copper and um, opportunities there. I'm, that's one of those noodle things that I'm working on with my uh, inner group, my uh, my like peers where we talk about entrepreneurial ideas. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a way to to bring scrap copper, proper scrap copper, and buy copper in a wholesale fashion, not in a retail fashion, um, and make some serious money with it. Well, there's a lot of gold and silver dealers, coin dealers that will will sell it. Mine down the the street does that and uh it's under four dollars a pound i believe so it's real economical now before it starts to skyrocket especially when silver you know almost pretty much runs out of supply with manufacturing and so forth but but basically would it be fair to yeah. say try try buying it for under four dollars so it, it, the spot may say 378 right. a pound right well you go try to buy that you're not going to be able to buy it no yeah i just meant the spot price yeah yeah the, the spot the, price the markup markup depends on the <laughs> but i mean compared to gold and silver it's a steal yeah um so would it be fair to say not you know putting words in your mouth but would it be fair to say that you would if someone doesn't trust the market or is just thinking about getting gold and silver is physical gold and silver. Is that something you typically recommend? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I recommend that everyone, including my children, <laughs> I told them, so my son got out of college and then the other one got out of college and I said, you need to have some silver. And we talked about what they should have. And, um, you know, as a percentage of their stuff, it was, it was significant. But I wanted them to have that because I don't want them to be um, fully trusting everything that the banks and the government is telling them in regards to their money. But I want them to invest into themselves even more so than investing into gold and silver. You know, they, they've been doing that. And so um, that's really important. But then there gets to be a point where you get a bunch of money. You say, how do I protect it? How do I, you know, keep it from, you know, crashing on me? And, you know, in a long haul, it, it, it may go down. So I tell people, listen, you may buy gold or silver and it may go down 10 or 20 percent. It could. It could happen. But is it going to go down a lot? Probably not. Uh, the pressure upwards on silver to me is like 10 to one, <laughs> you know, it could go down 10%, but I expect it to go up 10 times that yeah. on yeah. the silver side. That's, that's at least my gut feeling from all the stuff I've looked at. I own both gold and silver. Great. Great. Thank you, Scott. Yeah. So just to the audience, if any of you are, um, on the fence about your 401ks, you're trying to get rid of it or you're trying to convert it. Um, I'm not a financial advisor, but Scott is. And uh, so we just make recommendations and there, there are some great options, but we have one for you that we'll put a link in the description for those who might want to take advantage of that. Um, Scott, we're getting close to running out of time here and I want to respect your time. Uh, so I will leave you with the last thoughts and words, anything that you want to say to the audience or anything you want to share, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, so I ask people, if you had $1 and 
and you could turn it into 1 billion in 12 months. What if I told you that routinely happens and it's legal? Hmm. Theoretically. So let me share. So um, my boys, you see the sunflowers, Van Gogh <laughs> behind me. Mm -hmm. This is my boys, preschool and kindergarten, Colin Mason. That's a 12 foot stalk. Mm. Had people stop in to look at the sunflowers. Well, they came up with a little bean from preschool and the little Dixie cup with the little bean. They were not impressed. It woke me up in the middle of the night. God told me, go to the big box store, go get a tray, go get some seeds. So I went and got some seeds, some mammoth sunflower seeds, got these and planted. There were 36 seeds and we had 30 of them produce these 12 foot stalks. They got super excited. We harvested after the birds and the squirrels and everything got to it. We harvested about 72,000 seeds, three months. And I said, let's do the math on that, boys. If we had land and water and we could harvest these seeds and go do that again with those 72,000 seeds instead of the 30, now we're going to be uh, 144 million seeds in another three months. And another three months after that, we're at over 28 billion seeds. Mm. We're talking about a billion dollars of retail value off a $1 investment. And so sometimes we get real limited. And one of the things I love is seeds and farming and sharing with people about abundance and um, connecting and grounding in the soil is a beautiful thing. Growing your own food is said to be, um, it's like printing money. I got okra and tomatoes and onions and 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 food that I'm growing. I got fruit trees. I picked a, a lemon off the tree at my office here this morning and I squeezed it into my my tea. I grow my own tea leaves. Oh. It's a beautiful thing. So when you think about abundance, think about a little acorn and a big tree. Think about the story I just shared with you. Um, each of us should ask, what can I do? What are my opportunities? What, what's in my hand? What, what do I have available? God, what would you have me do next with all that you've entrusted to me? Beautiful, beautiful. And you're absolutely right, Scott, the new economy that we're going into next year and beyond, uh, bartering and seeds will be the new currency, especially the non-GMO ones. Yeah. And I just gonna finish uh, for the viewers. I always get this question about, since you brought it up so, so accurately about Venezuela, you're right. They historically the fourth largest economy in the world. People always ask about the boulevard as a currency. And yes, they will go asset backed again and they will couple with oil and other assets. They will be restored to their former glory as uh, the world right sizes all of this uh, inequality and injustice financially and in other ways. So it's got Not with the current administration. <laughs> that's subject to change fairly soon as well. Yeah. Thanks, Scott, for your time. We really appreciate it. God bless. And I'd like to, uh, to, to welcome you back on again if time permits. All right. Super. Thanks, John. God bless.